Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this collaborative webinar between PMC and Simulate. Today's topic is solving real world problems with simulation software. My name is Brian and I'm on the marketing team at PMC and will be hosting today's session. If you have any questions, please utilize the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we will address those during the discussion time that is following the presentation. If you have any questions, please utilize that feature. And if you come up with any technical issues or questions, I'll address those the best I can throughout. Please note that you will be muting during the mic or during the presentation limit any background noise as the session will be recorded. Um, so just be sure that you're muted. Um, okay, now before we start, I'd like to do a brief introduction to PMC. Dave, if you mind going to the next slide. Since 1979, PMC has helped over 700 companies by completing more than 7,000 performance enhancing initiatives worldwide. It is our commitment to excellence that has brought us to the point we are the largest independent industrial engineering services firm in North America. Below is just a small sampling of some of our current and repeat customers if you wanna check those out. Next slide, please. Today's session will be focused on simulation, but here is a selection of the other services that PMC offers. These include things like reality capture, industrial engineering, simulation modeling, safety and quality, geospatial services, jig and fixture design, and steel detailing. I'll give you a moment to look at this slide. Now, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today's presentation. Next slide. So first up is David Stone. He is the Director of Simulation at PMC. Dave, go ahead and say hello. Hello, my name is Dave Stone. I've been uh, in the simulation world since uh, 2014. Um, getting my 10 years experience doing this, leading the engineers, um, using different various software, but Simulate is one of my favorite ones to use. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our other speaker, Tom Stevenson. He is the Director of Services and Strategic Partnerships at Simulate Corporation. Go ahead and say hello, Tom. Yes. Hi, everybody. Good to be here today. Uh, and thank you for having me. Um, as you can see here, I've worked on a lot of different uh, simulation projects across a lot of different industries and a lot of different countries. And I'm looking forward to showing you some of that variation in the, the projects that we deliver today. Yep, thank you, Tom. Now I'm going to turn things over to begin our presentation, solving real world problems with simulation. So Tom, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so just to give a brief introduction to simulate. So simulate, I, I've been with the company for uh, 10 years now, but Simulate has ooh, a little over 10 years, but Simulate has been around uh, for almost 30 years. Um, and in that time, we are always looking to make simulation very accessible and very easy. Um, so we've developed lots and lots of features to try and make it much easier to build a simulation of any process and have that virtual representation which can match your real system so that you've got it as a basis to test any kind of scenarios on it. Uh, so that's uh, that's Simulate. Um, we, as I, as I briefly mentioned, we want to really reduce barriers to access and time to value in any industry. And I'm going to show you two examples today. The first of those being a more of a manufacturing example. And this was um, when we were working with a company con called Controllant, who produced um, the technology to enable vaccinations to be delivered worldwide. And there was a, when we worked with Controllant on this, this was a time where they needed to ramp up production really quickly because we had just got the COVID vaccination in place. So, by having this in place, there was a need to really ramp up production to almost three times the normal amount, which, as you can imagine, um, is quite an undertaking. And they wanted to do this without too much waste, um, but they needed to understand how to ramp up effectively. So they worked with Simulate and we built a model of their um, current production. And then what we did was 
place in their target production. And we ran it through the simulation to understand where the biggest problems are and how to combat them. So I'm going to show you that simulation briefly. There'll be a few things that you notice. So anybody who's seen um, simulate models before will know that we can build them with a nice visual and the next one I show will will have that. But this one you'll notice is a little more kind of um, rough and ready, shall we say. So all the steps in the process are mapped out and that's what we do in a simulation. We, we map out all the steps and then we apply things like how long those steps take and where the um, objects go and also which um, staffing members or machines are needed for that. So the reason that we haven't spent as much time making this one look really nice was just because of the real speed that we needed to build it. Um, and this is something that Simulate does pride itself on is that ability to build simulations really quickly. Um, this one, we had to try and build it in less than a week, essentially, to understand how to effectively ramp up. So the, the way that we challenged this problem was we, we said, let's look at our target production. And we said, if we have that target production um, at the very start of the simulation run, we would need to produce 30,000 units. And when we press the go button, what we see are some results around where queues build up. So where we can see queues forming here, this is an indication that the amount of demand being pushed into the simulation cannot uh, be processed due to the capacity constraints we've got. So seeing this enabled us to systematically address those capacity constraints. So it, it was really about seeing a blockage and then removing that blockage. And the way that that might work in Simulate is by literally adding some capacity in this case. So for example, if I needed uh, another station here, I can simply go to an existing one, go to my duplication wizard, and create a new one and then this is going to add some capacity here and when i hit the run button we will hopefully see that this bottleneck has now been removed but what you might then see is that the bottleneck has been pushed elsewhere um and what we try and do is alongside the visuals uh, is have some results that are going to help us understand where the problems are so in this case we can see where staff are utilized at different times of the week and also, we can see charts for the kind of utilization of the machines and th the type of information we can see here is that these programming stations are quite a lot of the time resource starved, which means we, we maybe don't need to necessarily invest in more machinery. We might just need to have more people to operate the machinery. So that would indicate that maybe we should test this next. And what you would then see is maybe the um, following steps are not waiting as much or, or not as resource starved. So this is where we can use the results to make changes to the simulation, see what the impact is going to be. And um, what we're really happy with in this simulation is one that we could build it so quickly, but to the, the insight gain didn't just show where to increase capacity. It also showed where to work more intelligently. So for example, the, the, people that we had on certain machines we could think about cross-skilling them and seeing what impact that would make without needing to invest in necessarily more people so there's one example uh, from manufacturing and now i want to move on to a, a slightly different um simulation and i'm just gonna so this one is healthcare and what this was a pro bono project that we did um, to look at mobile treatment clinics. So this bus would travel around to different areas in South Africa. And the idea is that it could test um, people for HIV. Um, so it was a really convenient service. And what they wanted to do was make sure that this treatment facility could be configured quickly and easily to different places to serve the local population. So even though this isn't manufacturing, the, a lot of the steps are, are very similar. So when people arrive, they're going to have steps that they need to go through, which take a certain amount of time. 
And if there isn't the capacity available, we're going to start to see queues build up. And in the same way, we're going to start collecting results as to how those queues are impacted. So now what I'm going to do is quickly just show you that simulation again. So you see here, there's a bit more um, of a focus around making sure the simulation is a bit clearer and easier to understand. So you see, we've, we've put a visual on here and we've added a user interface. And, and that's because the focus here was being able to get a result in a lot of different localities. So we want it to be really easy to make those changes and see the result really clearly. So in this current scenario, when I hit the run button, we should see people starting to arrive and coming onto the bus. And we can see these cubicles. At the moment, we're just running with three to understand whether that can work. Um, seems to be working quite well. Now, we, we never really want too big a queue here because um, yeah, it's quite a sensitive subject. People probably don't want to be seen to be stood waiting in this queue um just because of maybe embarrassment of being there for for these tests so we wanted to kind of build that in to make it realistic try and limit this queue size um but also we wanted to make sure we can test as many people as possible to ensure that we are um you know diagnosing as many people as possible and potentially saving some lives so i can run this for a bit quicker now you can see what's happening and at the end of the run, we're going to get some some baseline results. Um, we we also have a results output. Um, so here it's held internally within one of our internal spreadsheets. Having this spreadsheet format means it's easy to uh, export to things like Power BI or Excel or that that type of thing where you may want to visualize results. Um, but again, what we're trying to do is just use these results about the flow to inform how we could maybe improve it. Uh, I mean, what I'm seeing straight away is that the HCA utilization is quite high. It's at 95 percent. And we can see the amount of clients seen is, is significantly less than the number of arrivals. So um, that indicates people maybe didn't want to stand in this long queue. Also, the average time in system is quite a number of hours. So what I'm doing is now using my user interface to change some of the settings. And I'm going to come into my resources and I'm going to change the healthcare advisors because they were the ones that were shown to be the most utilized. I'm going to give them another cubicle to use as well. So then what we do is we reset the simulation and we would rerun it. So the same arrivals are going to come in, but now we should see slightly better results. Again, I can run this quickly. And I can check as a side by side comparison. Um, the, what you should see is this has made a marked improvement. So the number of clients seen has gone up significantly from 380 to 488. That means we've got one more person who's diagnosed and can go into appropriate treatment. We've got Still quite a high utilization, so we could try again and increase that. But the average time in system has really reduced significantly. So what this client could then do is for each local area, plan their resources effectively so that they can treat that local community. Um, so hopefully you can see here two very different case studies. Um, but. We, you know, we have lots of other cases, but the, the concepts are very similar. We're trying to build a, a, a digital twin of the current process, and then we are looking to see what the impact of change is going to be. There's a couple of examples from Simulate. I'm going to hand back to um, Dave now, who I believe has a couple of similar or slightly different examples, which PMC have built. Thank you. I will... Yep, so go ahead and unshare, Tom, and then... Okay. Uh, Sorry, stop share. Here we go. Yep, now go ahead, Dave. All righty. So we're back to PMC. And 
what our company does is we have a methodology and we're a service provider all over the world with clients all over the world, industrial engineers all over the world. So we have a process and the reason why you want to build a simulation model and why is it a real system conducting experiments? Well, one is to reduce cost. It saves time. It reduces the time to develop. Um, if you know um, the layout doesn't work, why would you build it, right? Reduces uncertainty, increases accuracy, insights into dynamics. What do we mean by that? Well, maybe I need a buffer. Maybe I need more zones. Maybe I need more people. So it's, it's allowing you to get ahead of the curve. It's a risk-free environment. You're spending... Uh, tenth or even a, a less than that of the cost of a project to do a model. Our methodology is we have a kickoff with our clients. We want to establish the objectives, the scope, and the deliverables. We want to identify the team, right? The stakeholders, the roles, designate a single point of contact from the client and PMC. Then we're going to formulate the inputs and assumptions, working together with with you as a client, you will see that we look at, we need inputs, we need outputs. Um, we're gonna identify the key flow process. We even may use a process flow chart. Uh, the next step is data collection. If a client doesn't have it, we can set it up to where we use um, data supplied from one of their uh, sister plants. If they don't have one, we can formulate data that we have in our um, history. We build and validate the model. Then we document the process. So that's our process. Why do we do it? Provide you an analytic tool, statistical reports, visualize. A lot of us are visual people. We like to see the results. We want to see the simulation we're on. We need to have that ability to, you know, accurately ensure the data and the outputs and the inputs, meaningful insights to you. So again, we use an Excel interface. So, you know, as we're going along and building our model, we're also building this Excel interface. So when we read in a problem statement, we're gonna define it, we're gonna design the study, the conceptual model, and we're this is where our Excel comes in. Formulate the inputs, the assumptions, the process definition, then we're going to build it. And then we're going to have this experimentation part of this pie, which is very large. The reason being is there's questions that need to be answered. It's a process of building the model of real world systems, right? Conduct experiments. We want to know how it behaves. Now, I have two examples that I'm going to show you today. We built for our customers. It's a powerful simulation. We're trying to determine the optimal number of equipment, or we're trying to determine the optimal number of carriers that we have. Um, JPH, jobs per hours. What do we want to look at? Uh, do we can we meet production goals? So let me share my screen with. The models that I have. I don't know whether this worked. Going to screen. Share. Brian, can you see my model? Yes, I can, Dave. Okay, on this one, we're looking at a paint shop, the whole paint shop. So this is how big Simulate can be. We can do small individual lines, or we can do whole assembly systems, paint systems. Uh, body and white system. So it's a powerful tool. And when we look at this, you'll say, well, you know, what does it represent? Well, it represents the real world flow processes and inputs provided by the client. When we watch the model run, and I'll start the model here, you can see I've got it sped up a little bit. You're seeing things flow. It looks like it's flowing really fast. It might look like it's flowing backwards. So I'll slow it down here. 
and you'll see some things that fly across. That's because I've hidden the um, routing arrows. You can turn them on and off if you like to see them and want to know where everything's flowing to. Aesthetically, they're available. You can do that. Now I've sped it back up and we'll see it moving. And the reason why sometimes you don't have time to watch it run, you just want to get the results. So the speed bar allows you to run it to completion. Our clock up here tells us where we're at. We're at week one. We're running the model. It seems to be going, you know, fast, maybe. Depends on the number of objects you have in the model. How long it takes to run these different variations. So in a paint shop, you're, you may have five or six hundred or five or six thousand items, depending on what you've modeled in your model. And each of those takes a little bit of time to process as we're flowing through. We don't see anything moving. We, we see that we have equipment. And why is it going to put all this when it gets done? Well, it's going to put it in this Excel spreadsheet. And this is what I was talking about before, was how do we link the model? Why do we want to link it? Well, we want to know what all the processes are. We want to, in, we want to read in the gross JPH, the net JPH, the mean time between failures, the mean time to repair on equipment. So we have all the items listed in here. We also have subassemblies listed. Distributions that we're using, downtimes, are they, you know, we're looking at the system as a, a whole system, speed calculations. We look at the total time. If we have conveyor systems in, what's the pitch? What's the speed? Uh, meters per minute, millimeters per minute, feet per minute. You're able to do that. It gives you a gross JPH or a net JPH. Then we're looking for this history, the, the histogram of the outputs. So we're going to be using, you know, the Excel. Once the model finished running, you will get a completion beep, and this will update. Now we're at the clock. You can see we're at day three of the simulation, and it's we're in the second week. You can run this one week, two week, three weeks, but you got to make sure your system is in a steady state. Because in a steady state, you already know what's going to happen because you're already running the system. Now, if this was a brand new system that you don't know, you still want to run it to steady state, seven days a week. Um, and the reason you do that is you want to make sure that everything is full. Your model has got parts in it. We're not looking at... Um, half full systems and that reduces your your uh, available data um, now once this completes here we're at day five it's running for two full weeks one week we're going to throw the data away because that is our warm-up period warm-up periods are important in a model to make sure that they're functioning that you've got a model that has information in it and once we finish here, you will see that my Excel spreadsheet, I'll bring it back up. We'll look at the histogram, see if anything's changed. Oh, by the way, did I turn on downtime? Did I not turn on downtime? So when we look at this, you know, a lot of people will understand box line and cab line. So it's a truck plant. So you're looking at, you know, the processes, the hang line. Metal finish. So maybe you're doing some repair parts, heavy repair. So this is where, you know, you might have a paint defect that you need to know. So you may have process there where how do I know how much I'm I'm doing, how much heavy repair? Well, if you plan for 10% and it's actually 20, what happens? Do I get backed up? Do I get stopped? Do, does my model crash? And that's always a possibility that something has caused the model to crash. Now with simulate, you'll notice that a few things are grayed out at the top. Now the model has completed. It's updating, it's reading and writing what it needs to do. And you notice everything that was gray at the top is now 
the correct color. You have the, the simulation assistant that's at the top for you. If you have it issues, it brings it up. So it'll say, hey, I may have done something wrong. So you have all of these informations that can help you. So you can click on this and it tells you detailed entry point. Right? So when you when you when you're running and building a model to solve problems, this is going to help you. Now it doesn't mean that there's an error in the model. It's just suggesting that you've done something that you need to adjust or correct. So we'll go back to the the simulation here and you're going to see here's my histogram so as i see this i can see at one point i dropped to zero most of the time the steady state and then boom i had a big downtime so i have major downtime turned on so if we go in here and we look at our inputs we go back to the top of the page and we see that we have these as inputs to the model. Warm up period, results collection. I want trolley analysis on, I want downtimes on. I want major breakdowns on. And the reason why is you want to calculate the overall throughput of your system. You want to make sure it works. So here's our throughput. This is what we were able to get over time. Can see that there was two periods, two hours where there was a major downtime, and in a paint shop that does happen. Um, from my experience, over thirty years in the, as an OEM uh, employee, you will see that. And then you've got the other spike down here, another two hours. Might have been a major cleaning event, might have been a major breakdown. But again, the histogram. So now here we are looking at the top rank of problems what's my number one bottleneck is it this guy here or is it this guy so we can do all this time and state charts that show you what happened when it happened are we highly utilized are we underutilized starved block change over times off shift as you can see we rank some of these here's the number one rank it's the sub right front door. So, and the left front door is the second one. So if we were to go to look at these, the changeover is the biggest issue here, right? We didn't have a lot of downtime. You know, paint entry had the most downtime. We were blocked and starved on a lot of things. Um, so this is a way to check your, your, your data. So now I want to look at, and I have this set up so, so that I can get different graphs and charts here. The data is on the right side, so I can do my analysis. So, you know, was, was this a problem? Or was it not? So I'm able to, to look at different things from our model. It's been built up. There's another work in process. Uh, I click on the line chart. It generates from the data. This data was all read from the model. So this is one of the things that we do at PMC is we use this Excel interface. We give you a cover page. We'll give you the objectives. Build a 2D simulate model, identify throughput of a system, following inputs, cycle times, buffers, downtime, carrier counts. We want to know the optimal number of skids. The assumption is that the body shop will always be running the same, and all subs are going to be on the same time. Body is always going to be available to the skid. So we didn't model the body shop. We didn't model the general assembly, which is afterwards. It's a continuous moving line. So we put those key assumptions in there. Now on our other model, we are looking at how many machines do I need? How much? equipment is available. So I have all of this equipment in here and I start running the model. And again, we're doing the same thing. We're looking at data. 
and you're seeing activities happen. We're seeing parts. Oh, it told me it's not responding. Is it busy? What do I need to do to fix this? Right? So I can hit retry. But the other thing is I need to make sure my Excel is open, that it's in the same spot and I've got it open. Now, some things that you're going to see is that the problem is we can ignore it and say, okay, but it just shut off the model. So I go back to and I reset it. I make sure that that opens up and comes in and gives me where my machine input. This is where I change everything. I have things that grayed out that I don't change, things that I do change. So I want to run five days or I want to run two days. So I can change the model right here. I'm not having to go into every one of the simulation models. So I hit a reset button. It brings it back up. It's looking for this data. And we wait until everything is back to normal color because it's reading that Excel spreadsheet. If you don't wait and you start running it, you may get an error. So now we're running it. And what happened? Well, I may not have run it long enough, right? It's, so I go to my simulation assistant again. I'm looking at how to do the things, old percentage use, batching very large. I didn't use high volume. Why didn't I use high volume? Before routing engine, it was most likely wrong. So there's some things that you can do in a model and this is why with simulate, it's very easy to use. If you need help, you can click on the help button. You can go right online, online help desk. And I don't think that came up in the screen I wanna show you, but they are right there. You can put in questions and that, that will help you. Now I'm going to, Go back to my PowerPoint, but I want to show you that the website came right up. It helps you, you get help, you get a ticket. They'll get in touch with you as soon as possible. Uh, but there is a lot of help online. They have a blog. You can ask questions, you can search help. And my PowerPoint. Oh. It's in, there it is. Ryan, can you see my PMC screen? Yes, I can, Dave. Okay. So what did we accomplish with using Simulate today? Well, I have a lot of clients that don't know simulation. They want to learn it. It's a good way to start. But you get the basics. Now, if you remember my screen, I didn't show you any of the how to's, how to build a model, how to run a model. You know, we just talked about model performance and why we're using discrete events. So that concludes my presentation today. Now we're into the question and answer session. And I thought we had a question that popped up. Yep. So we did have a few questions come in during the presentation and we'll get started with those, but please, if you have any questions, now's the time to utilize that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you wanna ask one of our speakers a specific question you might have. Um, so the first question we did have come in said, can you suggest sites or steps on how one can start simulate and how to get a handle on it? Um, I'm not sure who wants to tackle that question. Could be Tom, could be Dave. Um, I don't know who wants to take the initiative on that one. So, yep, go ahead, Dave. So we've listed the, the websites that are down here. So you get simulate.com without an E. And Tom's emails here. They also have our PMC contact. You're more than welcome to, to send a, either one. Uh, we do offer custom training that is designed for beginner level um, instructor-led virtual training so that you can um, 
get, get your questions answered right away. Simulate also has training videos online and offers training uh, through their corporate. All right, thank you, Dave. Yeah. Um, um, Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo that, that I think there's probably um, numerous different options depending on your location and, uh, you know, what industry you want to learn in. But I know I know PMC's training is good. I know Simulate's training is is very good. Um, so you've got that option. Um, also, you can get a trial as well. If you search for Simulate trial, you'll be able to get access to that. That will give you a, a five day trial to kind of test out the software if you want to just use it. Um, so lots of options there um, or do just reach out to to one of us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, another question we had when you are building a model to see if a proposed design is viable, where do you get your data from? So I'll take that one, uh, Brian. So PMC has been doing this for over 40 years. So we work with a lot of clients and some clients use surrogate data, which is similar equipment. Some clients have a preset downtime data for robotics for weld stations for operator stations so they provide us data and if they don't then we can do on-site data collection or the client can provide on-site data collection and we'll give we'll assist them with what we how we need it what we're looking for and the third one is we can go out to the manufacturer's websites and look at their historical data. Um, not all of them provide, you get some that are real good and some that are so-so, but with PMC's vast knowledge and you know my over 30 years is at an OEM, um, we have that expertise to understand what downtime should be applied to different systems and how to do it by zones, by stations, um, and provide you with a way to um, get a good resulting model. All right, thank you, Dave. Uh, another question we had, can you model an existing production line with a planned downtime? I can certainly take this one. Um, yeah, so uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we can base that on different dates in the calendar. And there's a feature within Simulate that allows you to have um, scheduled maintenance. Um, and we can we can put that in whenever we need it to be. Also, we can have um, any types of shifts and things like that that allow us to um, stop the operations whenever they would stop in real life. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, another question, I guess this one would be for you, Tom. In the controllant simulation, you spoke about a need to build the simulation quickly. What's the quickest you can build a simulation model? Um, so, yeah, I think you can, uh, obviously it depends a little on the industry and the complexity of the, the process, but uh, certainly with every simulation, we're looking to add value in hours rather than days and weeks and months. Um, not, not to say that we'd have a completely finished simulation, but I think we can certainly, by discussing the process and mapping it out and laying on some preliminary data, we can start to get a good understanding of where issues might be in the system without needing to put a lot of uh, work into it. Obviously, you're gonna wanna layer on the complexity to increase the accuracy. Um, so it, it can take, a bit longer to sort of complete a model but i'd like to think that everybody can get some really good value within a week um and then obviously just depends on the level of detail you want to go into um i mean one of simulate's new features actually is um a process mining feature that allows the simulation to automatically build from a data set which means that you could in theory build a relatively simple model immediately and it's not quite as um you can't do everything with it. You would probably want to just have it as the, the initial template for now, and then you can layer things on top of it. But uh, it's good to know that in the future, that might continue to develop and it might be we might get to a stage where 
a really detailed simulation can be mapped out from just having a, a data set. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, another question we had, when opening my model, I sometimes have an issue with the input Excel file not reading. Uh, why does that happen? I'll take that one. So what happens when you read in from Excel? Well, it's looking for the model and the Excel sheet to be in the same folder. So if you stored them in separate folders and you didn't open the Excel, you might get a circular reference error. You might get a uh, unable to read, just like I showed you on the screen. That happens because one, what Excel was it built in? And two, where are you using it? Did you allow it to read? So with simulate, if you didn't let it read all the way in, it will give you an error when you start running it because it's looking to, to get all the data in that you pre-wrote in Visual Logic. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, another question we had, what types of variation do you typically build into a manufacturing operation? For example, like downtime, part supply, worker skill, et cetera. Um, I, I can I can go first, uh, Dave. You might want to add on to, to this, but I think um, you you can build every piece of detail that you would see in reality in terms of any complex decision logic and that kind of thing, or you know whenever workers shift or downtime all of that you can add uh, but my my advice is to always kind of layer a lot of detail in the areas that you're looking to improve because then that adds a bit of confidence that um you've done a real thorough job in those areas and it's probably less important to um model in really great detail the parts of the system that you're not specifically trying to improve um that's just a, a good way of um handling projects so I, I think to to again reduce that um speed of build and you can always layer on detail um afterwards as well so um that's how i would approach it but i don't know if uh you have any different answer there dave so one of the things that we do is we look at the operation right so if let's say an operator and you have a new operator you can adjust his in simulate the resources available and you can put some things on him. Travel time to the job. Uh, if he's shared resource, the travel time between the two and you can see how much time the, the worker's running back and forth. Then you can also put some information on that worker. Then with parts, we can have the main line coming down where you're carrying a product and you're going to add parts. So we have another entry point and we can say that we're bringing those in in batches of 12, 50, 500, whatever you need to bring in. So that is how you would model the, the, the secondary part coming onto the line. Downtime, you try to put the correct amount of what typically is either uh, line side maintenance, uh, central maintenance, or let's say that you're using the operators to handle low hanging fruit. So I get a fault, the operator can push fault reads. So you can have three different types of downtimes that you wanna include. And you're able to do that with a distribution in the downtime. So as you model different things in there, you can make it a fixed time, an Erlang, um average distribution you can change that distribution you can also create your own and attach it in one of the custom um sheets that you build in the model okay thank you guys um another question we had in this model a lot of excel interaction was used while working for the customers also is the excel input and output used or statistically distributions are also used? So we do both. So there's that feature that you can have uh, one of the Excel sheets that I brought up had a distribution. 
and it was agreed upon with the client, hey, we're going to do a fixed distribution, we're going to do an average distribution, and then we're going to do an Erlong distribution. And the reason why you want to do different ones is um, you really want statistical data, right? You want to get as close to reality as you can with a model. Uh, we always like to say in my business, 95% confidence level, we will mirror your production. Now, why is it only 95? Well, there's variables that I can't account for. Electricity is not there on Monday. The internet went out. The plant didn't get orders on Tuesday. Um, things that we don't model normally in a plant. We don't model, we normally don't model that you have air supply, that your power is on. Um, so there are some things that you maybe want to add in your distribution. Um, there are catastrophic event downtimes. And usually you don't want to have those in your model because it, it will uh, cause the data to be off to the left or to the right, depending on what, when it happens. Um, the Excel is our workbook. It's one way that we have it to fast entry. If I had to go into my model and update all the cycle times on every one of these, it's a right click, right click, type in, click again, OK, and then move the mouse to the next one. With an Excel inter interface, I read in all that data. So I can go in and change the cycle times just on a few pieces of equipment or all of it. Let's say I have a JPH increase and then we're able to look at, you know, hey, here's the cycle times. We think we're going to need to be at 45 seconds. We run the model. It says we didn't make it. So now I go back in and I can make a quick assumption on that, that all of those are going to be 44. So it, it speeds my process on the experimentation side. It slows me down when I'm building a little bit because I have to make sure that, you know, I'm reading right, the right columns and everything in, but I get that up front. And then in, in the back half, and you saw Tom do his model real quick, did those changes. He used an internal sheet. Now I use an external because I like to do some other things, charts, bar charts, graphs, and we give that to the client with the model. Good, thank you, Dave. Uh, I think the last question we have here is, in the simulations shown increasing capacity was found to be the solution to the client's problems. Are there things you can test if you can't increase capacity due to things like space or budget or other things? Uh, yeah, I can, I can have a go answering that one. So. Uh, I think there's there's quite a lot of things that you can test that don't necessarily require you to invest in um, new staff, new machinery and that cut type of thing. And we know that that might be a limitation, uh, but often we see people able to improve a process without doing that. Um, it can be a case of maybe reassigning different members of staff to different areas. It could be working at different times to better match your um, better match your demand and capacity. Um, it could be just different rule sets to use. So it might be that rather than routing to one particular machine, you choose to only do that under certain conditions um, that gives you a better result. So I think there's there's lots of questions about how a flow works that don't where the immediate answer isn't just to increase capacity. Um, and I think there's the, the flexibility to do that. And although a lot of the um, increases of capacity uh, you can you can change easily, we do have a scripting language behind the software as well called Visual Logic, where you can build in any kind of logical decision making, uh, which might be quite different. Um, it, it might mean doing things in a completely different way, but um, you certainly don't see any limitations in terms of like increasing capacity. Um, and I was working on a project recently with a call center and rather than looking at increasing the number of agents, which would be naturally make the increase, they were working on um, different technology, which can effectively block a call if they know that that caller is going to be waiting a long time for their call to be answered and, and sort of tell them to call back later because it, it's not going to. So it can be things like switching on that type of 
um, input to see what the difference is going to be. I'm sure there are a lot of other cases like that in all, all different flows. All right. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I don't see any further questions coming in at this time. So with that, we'll close the Q&A session. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Dave, for answering those questions. If you think of any additional questions or like to discuss how PMC can help you design other process improvement strategies, I recommend you go to our website at www.pmcorp.com or check out Simulate. Uh, if you want us to look at upcoming um, webinars, I also recommend going to our website and clicking on the resources tab. Um, this webinar is also being recorded, so if you want to view this at a later time, it'll be up on our YouTube channel either later today or early tomorrow. If you want to check that out, share it amongst your friend, uh, colleagues, we recommend you do so. Our YouTube channel is PMC Videos, so that's videos with an S and all of one word. Um, there's also other stuff you might want to check out on there if you want to look at other things that we've done in the past. Um, but with that, that will conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for attending and hopefully look forward to joining you another one in the future. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.